All right, it is 430 and we do have a quorum. I know we have some folks uh, coming in that are in the waiting room. Um, we instituted some additional safety measures on our Zoom uh, based on our uninvited guests from last night. So uh, welcome everyone to the 430 additional meeting, uh, November 20th uh, meeting of the Hadley Public School Committee. Is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, um, we do have some adjustments to the agenda. First of all, we um, failed to add public comment to this agenda, so we do need to add that. Um, that will come before the presentation of um, public, the review of public health data. We also need to add to our agenda um, the uh, approval, review and approval of the minutes from our executive session meeting last night with the um, Hadley Education Association, the HEA. Were there any other adjustments to the agenda that were needed, no, Annie? I don't have any others. Can I just ask, Heather, there's 10 people in the waiting room. Is somebody responsible for letting them in? Wait a minute. Um, yeah, you all can let them uh, okay. let them in if the if there are names associated with folks waiting in the waiting room and the Perfect. name is not somebody who's already in here like one of us. <laughs> all right. Great, so those are our additions to the agenda. So we'll, with that, um, we will then go to public comment, then we will do the review of public health data and the review and approval of the minutes uh, and adjourn. So let's move into public comment. We have changed the um, security measures to where um, we will need to allow you to unmute yourself. So if you do have a public comment um, and would like to raise your hand, uh, raise your digital hand and we will unmute you and um, so that you may speak during public comment. I'm just gonna give it a moment. Okay, and I don't see anybody in the waiting room at this point. Again, um, if folks have public comment, please raise your digital hand. Okay, all right, with that, then we will move forward to the next item, which is the review of the public health data. Annie. Yes, so we have uh, the data that were uh, published yesterday, you can see here, you should be able to see, um, the case count in Hadley, the case count in the last 14 days is an additional seven cases. The average daily incidence rate per 100,000 in Hampshire County increased from 10.4 to 16. The testing positivity rate in Hampshire County increased from 0.63% to 0.92. The graphs are simply the data that you see in uh, the graphs are simply the data that you see in the chart. Um, in terms of school, the previous three weeks of school data or schools, just look around here, uh, the past three weeks, the purple heading, lilac heading, those are students. And then no fill is um, no fill is our staff. I want to clarify because families received notification today that these are only um, staff and students who are participating in a in-person or hybrid program. That's what um, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's report includes. That's public on their website. You can find that in the spreadsheet of all the weeks that they started collecting and publishing the data, but it only reflects students um, and staff that are in person. It does not reflect remote. And some of the thresholds, just a reminder for the public and the school committee.
the incidence per 100,000, the Hampshire County rate, uh, testing positivity, and evidence of school transmission. I'll turn it back over to the school committee to have a discussion. Thanks, Annie. So yeah, obviously, um, you know, we're seeing our Hadley numbers go up. We're, we've seen Hampshire County numbers go up, uh, although based on our criteria, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, where there is one that is over our threshold as it was last week, which is the average daily incidence rate. It's in the orange. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, we've been monitoring these to determine, are we going to change, you know, course, go back a step at all. I think in kind of partnership with the discussion with the HEA last night, um, which we're going to talk about in terms of the, the meeting minutes, um, I feel like those are some prudent steps that we will be addressing in terms of the next phase uh, and the timing of that. Um, but I guess I would ask the committee what your thoughts are on this data and whether there is a change that we should be looking at to the present course or should we be focusing on really that next phase? So I have a question. You're good. Uh, Mike, um, so I, I just wanna make sure that we understand that, um, so to recap the message that went out today. Can we just recap that message that went out today, Annie, um, to the entire school community? Um, sure, Regard, regarding the confirmed positive? Yes. Yes, so an individual in who's a confirmed, uh, a confirmed positive, an individual who's in remote. So that message, the reason that you don't see that here, so there's Hadley, the reason it says zero, zero here, it's not because we're attempting to mislead anyone, but because the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education does not publish, do not publish data for uh, remote individuals. And we have chosen to publish all of our data. So if it's a remote case, it won't match the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's report. This is only in person. Okay, and, 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 and last night, I know this was covered, but can you remind me um, what percentage of Hopkins students are presently in person and what percent are presently remote? Uh, in Hopkins, it is roughly a quarter of the students I think we're down to, let's say roughly about one quarter, 25% are present and 75% are remote. And at Hadley Elementary, it is about 81% present and about 19% remote. Okay. And, and what are the rules around, um, so schools aren't required to report that there, there's a case, period. No, schools always report. We okay. always report, staff or student. When that comes to our attention, we report in two places. Our school nurses contact the Department of Public Health and our school nurses contact the rapid response unit at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Okay. So we report to both of those places. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they do not publish data on remote, right. which is why, or actually it would be, no, which is why you would see, you, you're not seeing, you're seeing zeros here. And I sent out an email that that indicated to you that one remote, um, we had one remote student who tested positive. Got it. That's why that doesn't match. Got it. And, and it's, um, we have a fair degree of confidence that if there was a case uh, that's either a remote student or exposed student or family member that we have visibility when that happens? Do we have a high degree of confidence that when those situations happens, happen, we have visibility? Uh, that so what has been working very well for us currently is um, that our, first of all, that our families have done such a remarkable job of responding when um, we've asked families to pick a student up. Families have also been extremely responsible about keeping 
children home and going through that checklist. Um, if there's any, if a child exhibits any symptoms, our staff have been extraordinarily responsible. Um, there is, and I had wanted to have more data around what the what the goals of the contact tracing collaborative are in terms of its capacity. I put in a call today to an epidemiologist at DPH and was then directed over to um, the contact tracing collaborative, but I didn't hear back from them. I am unclear and perhaps uh, when Emma joins us and I believe she will be here shortly, um, although she, it's not her job to speak for the entire CTC or contact tracing collaborative, but it is my understanding at this point that the Contact Tracing Collaborative um, is, uh, a, is a bit overwhelmed at the moment. Uh, we can see why that would be because we have escalating cases throughout the state and certainly in the area. Um, so I did have a question as to whether or not uh, the capacity of the Contact Tracing Collaborative uh, would have any relationship to uh, our ability to monitor what's happening on the ground. And um, what I've requested is uh, if they have targets, in other words, um, our goal is to contact trace 100% of all close contacts within a X hour period, 24, 48, 72. I am curious as to what those are if they exist and the extent to which the CTC, the Contact Tracing Collaborative, currently has the capacity to meet its targets. I don't have that information this evening, but I'm looking for that information. I've asked them for it. So it and it, it sounds like it's safe to say that it's not as fast as you would would have expected uh, or when we um, first imagined that contract tracing would be available to us. I I am I do have some concerns about um, the I. That's why I'm asking the questions. So I should I should say it that way. I don't. I'm asking the questions because I don't know. Okay, That's why great. I'm the Fair enough. One last thing. Um, you mentioned having a high degree of confidence in um, in our level of awareness when there's a situation involving students and our faculty, but those are the situations that are in our school. Correct. The students are coming into school on the daily. At the Hopkins middle school and high school side of things, that's in the minority. So what is our level of confidence about the visibility for the great majority of other students who are not in the schools? How, how, do, how are they required to report? Uh, Desi clearly is not, but are we, how do we know that um, we have full and accurate information there? So we've asked parents, and our parents have been, I mean, obviously, even in, in this situation here, have been extremely responsible. We've asked our families um, out, of, out of acknowledgement for their responsibility to our entire community, teachers, students, other families, to inform us because we contact tracing, when, it, when we're talking about a student or staff member in the school, the contact tracing starts with our school nurses immediately. And so by informing us, of um, what's happening in a household, we're able to either do the, the lion's share of the contact tracing or work with the Board of Health to make sure that contact tracing does occur, that it's thorough, that it's complete, and it happens. Um, so if you're asking me, do I, do I believe that our families are being forthcoming with this information? I do. I have no nothing to indicate that they are not being forthcoming. Quite the contrary, the families again have been extremely responsive in terms of adhering to our expectations and protocols. So, um, and uh, we were notified in um, this most recent uh, incident. Great. I'm glad. That's. It's good to hear that we have a high degree of confidence in that data. Thank you. In the behavior of the people in our community, I do. I do. In the behavior of the families in our in our school district and in our staff who have been extraordinarily responsible. Um, yes, I do. I, the capacity of uh, the CPC, I'm I'm looking for answers to that. Great, thank you.
So what would be the, what was our uh, current phased plan? So we're in the second phase, correct? And that is supposed to time out December 7th. Is that correct? Uh, yes, if you were to count the week of Thanksgiving, if you weren't to count that week, it would be December 14th. That's what was supposed to happen, correct, um, to continue. And then uh, roughly around December, let's say mid-December, phase three was supposed to begin. Right, and so now we have one of the three, as Heather said, three criteria has been met, triggered, exceeded, however we want to say it, right? We have two weeks of above the nine uh, metric, right? Yes. The county, yep. The mm -hmm. county metric, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. So on one hand, there's not really a question for us now because we're not transitioning to the next phase other than we would want to let people know but I think, as you said, Heather, there's other conversations and ideas on the table, but so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we should just raise those now because it's related to this, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we did go into executive session last night and we discussed with the HEA uh, essentially details around phase three. Um, and so the minutes that are summarizing that meeting essentially um, center around really three aspects of, uh, of the discussion in the district reopening plan. So the first one being that uh, a request to an, an agreement to delay the start of the next phase, phase three, to no earlier than January 19th of 21, um, to continue with shortened days, the no lunch served on campus for five days a week through the next phase, so through phase three, uh, and then to look to the phase three Hopkins schedule that was proposed originally in the reopening plan, which we've discussed in, in prior meetings as uh, wanting to think about if there were other ideas around that phase to uh, really look to try to have um, or to discuss a modified schedule that would allow Hopkins Academy students to attend in-person instruction gradually uh, and bring that to us it, as part of our review process. It'd be, you know, have it reviewed and vetted just as we had our summer plans reviewed and vetted uh, very transparently. Um, but then that would, I think, get at some of the discussion we just had around Hopkins being a 25% present and a 75% remote. And as part of that, kind of a fourth component, a side component, we also discussed that the, the HEA is open to the superintendent opening after school for HES students and presenting a plan uh, that doesn't require students to remain in grade level cohorts during after school uh, in the future. So that's, that's something that is not part of their contract and we aren't negotiating that, but they wanted to state that position on the record as recognizing that, you know, folks are looking for after school uh, solutions. And so um, given, given that looking ahead, that that's something that they want to discuss. But focusing really on how this is related to the data and you know, what we've said all along in terms of reviewing this data was really, I think, twofold, right? It's, are we good to move forward into whatever the next phase will be at that time? And, part two being, or is there an issue that we need to dial it back and go back a step at all, change our current, our current plan? And I think last night that discussion really did center around the looking ahead, phase three, looking at a different, I'm just letting an Am Emma Dragon, um, looking at a different start date uh, for that being January 19th, 21. Uh, in collaboration with uh, the the educators and the administrators in the building. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, anyone else would like to speak to the, I mean, I've just recapped the minutes or the nature of that discussion. Um, but I think overall, it it is really with the health and safety of the students and the administration, the, the educators in mind, but also looking with an attention to recognizing the importance of in-person instruction. I think we're trying to do, we're trying to discuss uh, both of those things in the same, 
in the same uh, light with the data. This is Paul, just maybe a, a thanks to the HEA for coming forward with some thoughtful ideas and know how to do this. And I think some of the questions that we had asked last night was why January 19th, you know, why wait? And I think there's twofold reasons that I sort of heard and we discussed. One was we, we have this current uh, blip in the, in the rates right now, so uh, it gives it some time to reduce. And then also knowing that the holidays are coming up and and we're all going to be indoors and so there's some suspicion that rates may continue to climb or at least stay at this high level so um, January gives us a bit of time for whatever happens during the holidays to cycle downward hopefully and then I like that you know I'm really curious to see what they come up with for how it looks for Hopkins you know, like you said 25% attendance I think is in my experience directly uh, related to the fact that um, given how Hopkins has to operate and they have to move classes, we really need to balance limiting that to creating some opportunity for synchronous learning, which is much different than what they experience in HES. So I'm looking forward to how they kind of think through that. Knowing though, just saying that they're, it's not, it's still gonna be half a day and it's not gonna most likely look at synchronous learning for that full half day, meaning the kids are not gonna be moving around to different classes for half a day. It's gonna be something else, right? It's, Correct. At least those are the ideas they're discussing, so. Yeah, and just to restate, so the, the Hopkins Academy faculty, there's a group of folks working on that with the principal, um, but I think so people have realistic expectations. What we want to avoid is significantly, so we're, we're at the earliest looking to start another phase, not until mid to late January. And that is to take into consideration holidays, likelihood of travel, and what's currently going on in terms of average daily incidence rate. So um, to slow down any move forward. It also, um, we recognize that when students have the opportunity to have live in-person instruction, which right now they have live in-person support, their instruction remains remote at Hopkins Academy, it is highly likely that these numbers could double, triple uh, very quickly. And so the idea, we certainly wouldn't want to have that happen. Many, many more students in the building and at the same time have students walk through their entire schedule in a morning. Um, that would uh, introduce uh, a lot of risk all at once, or maybe a lot of is not a very good quantitative scientific term, but it would introduce what feels like an uncomfortable and unacceptable rate of risk all at one time by um, increasing the population significantly and simultaneously having students attend multiple classes. In the original plan, we had one full day, students attending all their classes. And as we talked about last night, and we've been thinking about that really for the amount of risk that it introduces, the amount of instructional benefit and educational satisfaction that children are likely to get is, is not commensurate with the risk you're introducing because you would have one day of movement, four days of no movement, and it's a waterfall rotating schedule. So you're kind of not sure which class is going to, and it's only happening on Monday. Um, and a reasonable question that the audience may be asking themselves is, well, if it sounds so terrible, why'd you put it in the plan in the first place? Um, that was a lot of pages of a plan, right? It's like a hundred pages of a plan. There were a lot of things to think about, how to drop off students, how to pick them up, how to put them on buses, how to get them to walk down the hallway, how to, it's a lot of things to think about. So it, it did seem reasonable at the time. And I believe over the summer, I'm the one who introduced this idea that, um, seem like, well, well, maybe that would work. That seems kind of reasonable and it seems like a balance of risk. And we did ask Dr. Allen, but of course, remember Dr. Allen doesn't teach high school. He's a brilliant man, but he doesn't teach high school. So he said from a risk perspective, it seems reasonable. Um, but now that we have experience on the ground, we are learning all kinds of things. And so I'm certain that the teachers and the principal will introduce an alternative that moves us toward um, this goal with not unnecessary deliberation or um, not unnecessarily slowly, but um, carefully and thoughtfully. 
I, I think the thing that I valued from the discussion last night as well was, you know, a willingness to look at that plan and really um, just see what might need to be fine tuned based on now experience and based on where we are now and not just trying to stick to our guns and plow ahead with something that may not work. Um, so I, I appreciated that willingness to just go back, revisit, look at it now that we are here, uh, where we are now. Um, I think the other piece of this too, that, you know, we wanted to clearly communicate this phase and the timing, um, at least the initial or no earlier than timing, given that there may be families counting on phase three starting on that December date, whether that be the 7th or the 14th, however you count. So we wanted to bring this back quickly uh, tonight to be able to talk about this and be clear about what the next, um, what plans are in terms of the starting of that next phase at this point. I can add to it too, when we look at our, um when we look at our metrics and when we're looking at our little color coded scheme and we're in the orange right now, you know, a lot of that is really looking at um, mitigation and risk reduction and this really um, reevaluating um, our current phases and adjusting how we're looking at the phases as we learn more and as we're in real time data. Um, and making sure that what we're doing is continuing to be safe is really, it is really when I look at that, what's, what's being advised in that orange risk level, right? So, you know, when you reach that red, you know, then there's concerns, okay, maybe we need to think about going remote, but really in that, that orange phase, it's about what can we do to not further increase the risk, right? Which isn't necessarily just, okay, we all need to stay at home. It's more about how can we ensure that while the state numbers are going up and the country's going up or whatever it may be, or surrounding counties, how can we ensure that we remain safe at school? And so I, I think that what was proposed and what was discussed last night really ties into where we are in the data as well. Um, this really is a, a, a mitigation strategy and, and a way to continue to proceed safely, um, you know, and, and then review um, how can we get into that next phase without increasing the risk. So I do think they tie together. I, if I may, I'd also just like to remind families, I appreciate the fact that we're letting them know that if folks were anticipating uh, a shift in the next few weeks, that that will be delayed to no earlier than January 19th. Also to remind people, um, you know, thankfully, and not without a tremendous amount of work from our administrators and teachers and staff, and our families, cooperation and help from our families. Uh, we have been carefully, deliberately, albeit somewhat slowly, but we have been plugging along, right? We've been plugging along. And I would love to think, and, and we have been fortunate in that um, our case count has been for in-person learning uh, at zero, and we saw our first remote case uh, just recently. Um, and I say all that, and I hope that continues without a hitch, but I need to remind families that under normal conditions, it is within the law that um, if we have one nurse in the district, we can, we can operate. That's perfectly within the law. But in these times, I would not be comfortable having a school building open if we didn't have a school nurse in that building. School nurses are more likely than other folks to be close contacts by virtue of what they do. And so um, we could find ourselves in a situation where if we did not have, and there isn't a long, long, there, there rarely are long lists of substitute school nurses as any parent who's a registered nurse in the district knows, because I call you and say, hey, would you like to be a sub? So there, it, under normal times, there aren't a lot of subs. Um, there are very, very few subs available now. So we could uh, find ourselves in a situation where uh, we have to pivot to remote learning because of a condition such as that, 
or because um, we have to do contact tracing and in order to do it thoroughly, we need um, to close down the building for a period of time or if it were widespread, the district. So we have been moving um, carefully and slowly, but we have been consistently and carefully moving forward. But families should just remember that um, there, it is highly likely that between now and the end of the year, and certainly between now and the spring, that we will find ourselves in situations in which we do need to move to a remote instructional model. Obviously, if the data, as the school committee has talked about, if the data were in the red, if we had school transmission, that's, for those reasons, we would pivot to a remote instructional model, but there could be other conditions that cause us to do that. And I would love to say that it will be seamless and it won't feel disruptive, but I think that would be misleading. Um, unfortunately, this year, we just have to be prepared for these things or be prepared for the fact that we just can't ever be prepared until next year. I also see that Emma Dragon from the Board of Health has joined us. Um, would you like to, I'm gonna hopefully allow you to unmute here uh, if you'd like to say anything. Um. I just really want to thank the Hadley community, um, our families and teachers and staff and everyone who's helping support our school systems. I think that we are all doing an extraordinary job during unprecedented times and that these are really uncharted waters um, that I, th I know we are all thoughtfully trying to navigate through in the safest way that we can make it and not just physical safety, but also that emotional wellness that we all kind of talk about as well. So yes, the, the Massachusetts is in a surge. Um, certainly our, while well, our numbers are advancing in Hampshire County, it's at a lower rate than other places in the state in the United States as well. Um, I just really, I know we support um, the metrics that we had identified initially with the supporting the school system. Um, and I do, even though our average daily instance rate is in the orange column, I do wanna highlight the overall percent positivity that we're finding in our testing. Um, I just, I really think another thing to look at is with our cases that have been positive in our area, if they are correlated or identified as being directly related to our school-based population uh, and families, and really, we have not seen that. Um, and I think that's because our schools are set up in a, in a very, very well planned way right now um, to minimize and mitigate, mitigate possible transmission. And I think that's all I have to really say. Thank you. It's very much appreciated. Um, thank you also for joining us tonight. Um, yeah, I'm still in I'm still in my office in Amherst, but it's good. It's meaningful work. We're all doing it together. Thank you. So if I, I think, may, oh, go uh, ahead, Amara. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that um, you know, just as a uh, as a parent, and then also as a school committee member. Um, November feels like a bit of a roller coaster as we've been, you know, meeting on this school committee and seeing our numbers do, they, they were actually hanging in there for a while for uh, Hadley. And we, uh, I don't know, I, I personally looked at what was happening around the country and I thought, okay, well, we're not, we are a responsible region. We have a lot, a lot of clients as it relates to mask. Massachusetts has been pretty on, on their game. And, uh, and slowly we saw those numbers creep up. Even when we last met for a school committee meeting, I think our Thursday the 5th, the numbers hadn't come out yet. And that, that line graph and the numbers, they looked, they looked really good, 
and we did not have transmission in, in the schools. So it, it felt sound to begin thinking about the next phase and to begin thinking about students moving around from class to class. And, and, it, and these, the, the, maybe it was um, unrealistic to think that uh, this wouldn't be at our doorstep. And, and it feels like overnight we went from five to 10 to 16 percent um, per 100,000 uh, daily case count in the Hampshire County, which, and, and we have, you know, cases in Hadley. I'm optimistic that um, if we can go into the holiday season, um, keeping in mind that we can control the spread by wearing masks, by limiting our exposure, that we um, can practice these, um, these responsible behaviors. I I'm optimistic that as we turn the corner from the holidays, that we could be back in a better position than communities around us. And I, I feel like, I'm, I, I just feel really blessed for the leadership at Hopkins and Hadley Elementary for staying to the six feet rule, the mask wearing, the cohort, even though it has its challenges, the fact is we've been able to really keep things um, manageable. And that a lot of schools cannot say that. A lot of schools are still remote. They're not at all in person. The fact that, that we are is a testament to the, the plans and the ability to execute on that plan. So the fact that we are pushing back opening of our phase three to sometime in January, I believe January 19th is what we're looking at, that makes sense to me, especially in light of what we hear will be a lot of, will be, it invariably involves holiday travel. Um, and so if we can round the corner strong, and as we approach Jan uh, January 19th, it also feels really important to me that we're as a school committee and with the administration really keeping a close eye on those numbers, planning for a successful phase three, but keeping a watchful eye in case we are still strongly in the orange and not heading back to the green. So I, I think safety is the utmost priority, safety of, of, of our families in school, but also in the community. And, you know, it, it feels like we can round a corner into the spring when maybe vaccines will be more widely available and, and you know, treatments and all of that. But it's still a global pandemic. And so we just have to, you know, just pay careful attention to what the numbers are doing. So I, I, feel, I feel optimistic that we can manage this, but also still just as cautious. And um, I guess that is what I would say. Hey, Annie, what's a, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Where, um... What's Desi's position these days? I heard the commissioner was maybe was the secretary talking about um, the need for kids to be in school and the strong push that this administration is having to the point that they were going to start investigating schools that were not uh, that they thought should have kids in class more robustly. Um, where does all that stand? And and I had actually heard them say even when Springfield was in the red that they still felt that regardless of that, the kids should be in school. And, and I look to Europe right now, which has essentially closed down much of its economy, but yet keeps kids in school because they consider it essential. Uh, and I just wonder how they can be successful doing that and, and us maybe not so much. Are there also other schools around the country, other private schools, maybe locally where, I know there are private schools locally where kids are fully in class and functioning well, and I do not hear of outbreaks there. So. How is it they can do that? And we seem to be struggling to, to put that together. Just curious what the state's perspective is for us. Yeah, time. so the, it has changed slightly. The, um, on a call this week with the commissioner, in given um, some of the, the likelihood of holiday travel and, and other things that have increased concerns in various communities, it is, I don't know that that additional audits 
will be undertaken by the department. They did um, audit, I forget how many districts, but I certainly know of uh, several around us, uh, one of whom I spoke with this morning or yesterday, was just wrapping up a, a very uh, in-depth and challenging audit. But I don't know that they will be undertaking additional audits um, at this point in time. They may change that position based on the call that we had this week. And the, um, the conversation this week, certainly the commissioner and others in the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they do recognize how hard this is, how hard this is for families, and not just because things are so different than the way they were last year, for school committees to make really challenging decisions and there is very little, I mean, consensus around this just doesn't exist, right? Even when you read about changes, it's, it's really unanimous votes that you see in school committees. These are mostly split votes, it's just really challenging. People are not of a like mind as to what should be done and why it should be done. I think the commissioner, so the commissioner recognizes how challenging this is um, and uh, is, I believe, empathetic to that. Um, and also ask school committees, which all sc school committees are doing, and administrators, and to think about the costs of not having access to school. And that's not the case in Hadley. Again, families may choose remote, no families penalized for choosing remote, um, and children may be getting remote instruction at Hopkins, but they may come to school every single day for in-person support with adults. That is not true of the majority of districts around us. That is not an option. And throughout the Commonwealth, even uh, some folks from the Massachusetts chapter, the uh, American Academy of Pediatricians, are concerned about the increase in negative health outcomes, um, in um, social and emotional problems and uh, depression, anxiety, and even in some cases, uh, increase in um, suicidal ideation or attempts. And so what they ask is that, which, which to my knowledge, there isn't a school committee that, that isn't doing this. There isn't an administrative team and a teacher team and teacher union that isn't saying, okay, how do we do how do we do what is safe and how do we do what is right? Um, so yes, the, optimally all children would have access to school and Hadley all children have access to school buildings and caring adults at Hadley Elementary. All children have access to in-person instruction at Hopkins Academy. Again, it's in-person support. So we have made that option available and families may choose to remain remote is a choice we completely respect. And we certainly, um, our goal and our expectation is that our mitigation strategies will continue to be as effective as they have been. We just ended week 10 of children uh, having access to buildings, week 12 for faculty and staff. And we have not seen school transmission or even anything that would be a uh, high case count in the district. Um, so our expectation and our hope is that the mitigation strategies we're using will continue to be effective. Um, but that's, that's a long answer to a short and good pointed question. But commissioner is empathetic. Everybody knows how hard this is. It, is. it is important for children to have access to school. And there are a number of um, folks, medical professionals and uh, psychological professionals and others who have identified some of the significant consequences and uh, negative consequences for children who don't have access to schools. Again, not the case in Hadley, um, but also recognize how challenging this is. It's hard to know what exactly one should do. Yeah, thanks, Annie. And, and I should give you a shout out. I don't know if everybody knew you were invited to present to it. It was a joint committee, the state legislature on, on education and um, and you did a great job. You represented us very well. So thank you for that. Thank you. And I did not get Zoom bombed, which was really, that thank was goodness for that. <laughs> After last night, really glad that didn't happen at the State yeah. House. Well, Annie, one of the things you just said, though, did prompt me to, to think back to our meeting last night where we did say, 
if families had been waiting until the December 7th, you know, shift to the next phase, as was originally discussed, to have their kids go back to in-person instruction in the building, um, that even though we're talking about a delay of starting phase three to no earlier than January 19th of 21, should you want to have your child go back to the in-person instruction in the school, just reach out to your building principal because you do not need to wait until that January date. You do not need to wait until the December 7th date. Um, and so we want to encourage that for families who had looked forward to that December date, um, even though we're remaining in phase two is what we're, we're talking about. The one, thank you for that. Uh, that's a good clarification. The one point two is, um, you know, if we play out January 19th and if we follow that six week cycle that we have been following to look to the next phase, that takes us to the end of March, April, and then basically we have one more phase and then school's out. So I'd rather, I, my only hesitancy about this proposal is that we don't just look at it as a six week cycle, but we think of it as a shorter cycle because hopefully Hopefully the landscape will be different come March, April. And then maybe we can change even whatever we initiate January 19th, we can change it sooner than the end of March um, and maybe get the kids back in to something closer to normal before the end, the end of year is out. My worry is that if we, we look at six weeks come April, uh, you know, basically we make a minor modification then and there's no, for the Hopkins kids at least, there's no semblance of any normalcy at all this year and i think we could be smarter than that you know pfizer just seeking fda emergency of vaccine approval they'll start distributing it in december i know it's going to take a long time for that to get out and is not far behind so the landscape can change pretty rapidly in the next three months we'll have an administration that's going to be attent you know, attentive to these issues so i don't want to lock this in and just i think even the language i know we've been meeting more frequently than six weeks i know we'll keep that but even the language of just saying it's this isn't a six-week phase it's a, it's a, it's the phase until we have our next, you know, however we want to talk about when we'll move into that next phase. We'll reassess every two weeks and make that assessment. I think we found that we can adjust pretty quickly, faster than I thought, actually. So that's I my think, one edit. Yeah, and I think too to Tara's point from last night about not changing too many variables at once. It sounds like we do. I mean. NAU and the staff all have a commitment to getting an idea of account of really how many students back in the building are we talking about for phase three? How many families do want to shift uh, their students to coming back in? Just for planning purposes, that, that is necessary as we understand it. Yes, it, that would be necessary. I'm also assuming that um, families may say, we'll make that decision when we know what the schedule is. So once uh, Ms. Camuso and probably some other folks from Hopkins Academy uh, publicly present that for a discussion, that might inform the decisions that families make as well. Right, so we do have two more meetings on the books, as we mentioned um, last night. We have a December 7th and a December 21st, I believe. Mm -hmm. And if we need to meet again in the interim, we did talk about that last night in our meeting that should we need to add another one? We will. Um, I think we're committed to reviewing not only the data, but this proposal of what phase three um, would look like for Hopkins. Yeah. Um, one thing that we had discussed, and just so that um, the community really does understand, is that, you know, as Annie pointed out, we are we are in a good place that we're able to offer um, students access to the schools right now. But I think that the school committee's goal and the staff's goal is to be able to keep kids there. Mm -hmm. So everything that we do is, even if it does feel like it's moving a little bit slower, it's moving slower with the intention that we don't get ourselves into a place where we have to stop school or have kids bouncing back a little bit more than what we'd like to. So I think the goal is still, again, you know, yes, to move phases and get kids back to a little bit more normalcy and keep things safe, but really keep the schools open and not have to um, get ourselves to a point where we have to talk about um, 
closing down the schools. Um, and I think that a lot of that, and I think everyone's kind of touched upon it, but a lot of that is, it's not just um, the administration and the teachers um, and the way that the day is run and the school committee and what we're watching, it really, it really does take the whole community to remain vigilant um, and really help us out because that can really shape where we go um, and that we're, we're all in this together. It's not, you know, us against you, you against them, whatever it may be, everyone's in it together. And um, we all need to remain vigilant and responsible and aware um, <clears throat> of what's going on around us so that we can keep the schools open um, safely. And I, I do believe that every school committee member that is the intention is really to, to keep things open and keep moving forward um, in a safe manner. Um, the one thing that I've been thinking about too as we're talking here, and I know that it's not gonna be a, a favorable thought, <laughs> um, but you know, when I look at our last meeting two weeks ago and what our percent positivity from then to now is and what our um, rate of error incident rate was, that has gone up a little more than three times in two weeks. Um, one thing I wonder is if, if it continues to go up in that rate, I, I would actually want to consider us meeting weekly to make sure that um, <clears throat> we're still able to review that, able to review at least bare minimum, you know, what's going on in Hadley, because it may be something where we're not necessarily going to consider stay at home orders with our uh, two metrics, but we're still looking at, again, school transmission, but the, the town transmission too. And so I think we'd want to be able to review that pretty regularly if our rates continue in the trajectory that they're in. I am happy to send the invitations to the meeting um, for folks to review the data. May I, and the school committee want, may want to respond to the, the um, meeting more frequently, but just while I'm, you reminded me of something, Tara, um, if I could really ask families who are either with us now or who are listening, um, if I could just beg, whatever decisions that you make personally around the holidays are decisions that you personally make. As Dr. Fauci said in an interview today, every single family will assess um, what risks and what decisions make sense for their families. I am asking, and I trust that folks will do this, whatever the decision is, that if anybody travels or makes a decision around the holidays that makes sense for your family, but does involve people from outside of your household for the holiday, that if you would please, one, if it's travel, that you adhere to the quarantine expectations uh, that the governor has set forth. There is the option to learn remotely. Nobody gets punished for that. Um, or whatever, if there's any decision that um, perhaps introduced additional risk over the holiday season, uh, we're not asking you to call us and do some sort of confessional around Thanksgiving choices but please exercise your right, choice, and ability to have your child learn remotely. Again, a, a really successful year, unlikely that we don't have to pivot at some point, would be if we can just slowly continue to move forward. Um, I think about how the children at Hadley Elementary looked when they just got to come in to take their FAST assessments. I've never seen kids so, they dressed up Little girls, little bows on so they could go take a test. I've never worn a bow in my life, not even a job interview. And, and they were so happy. So if all of us could just, as Tara said, just work together, um, err on the side of caution in terms of our own decisions around, if we made some choices around the holidays, you have the option of keeping your children remote for learning. Um, and so please do that and, um, and adhere to the quarantine uh, expectations around travel if you travel and then uh, i know you brought up the meetings that's for the school committee to respond to but thank you everyone for listening to that thanks annie and tara to your point I, i'm fine with you know 
I review this data every time it comes out and I know it seems like if we call an emergency meeting, it's got to get posted. We've got to make sure everybody's aware of it. So we've got like a, what, two day delay roughly. I mean, I'm, I'm fine if we want to pencil this in, uh, even if it's a rather brief meeting to review the data publicly and just, you know, confirm or not confirm, you know, cause, uh, talk about the, the caution. I'm fine to do that as well. Annie, are there no contingencies during this era of COVID to be able to post and um, have a meeting uh, more rapidly uh, in emergency situations? I, I think, um, yes. So there's always, I can't quote for you right now what uh, the conditions that you have to meet in order to call um, an emergency meeting. Um, I. Uh, but I can certainly find out what those are, but I think the short answer is yes. There's always, there are, there are conditions under which you can call an emergency meeting even outside of COVID times. And um, if we're probably talking about needing to make an adjustment to some sort of instructional model for the uh, health and welfare of children, I imagine that that would meet that threshold. But I can, I'll find out so we know precisely under what conditions we can call those meetings. Great. Um I would be up for having a standing weekly, you know, half hour, 15 minute, look at the data, quickly weigh in. Um, I, I, I know that it could probably go long, but if we were really vigilant about um, trying to keep it manageable, I'd be happy to have this very regularly. Um, and it's also good to know, because so much can change, as we can see, triple in two weeks. So much can change from a Monday to a Friday. So it will be really important to know what those emergency um, uh, uh, measures are that we can um, deploy that as necessary. You know, we're, we're, none of us are traveling and we're operating remotely. And uh, we, we, our school committee members seem to be pretty senior members of their team have flexibility over their schedule. So, um, the fact that we were able to pull off a Friday meeting in, in 48 hours um, reflects that you could probably commission our crew pretty quickly. So, um, so yes and. Yeah. Yes I'll to the regular meeting and also emergency meetings. I'll send out options. Um, and then I'll just say I, I, don't, I don't love it. Um, you know, I think just like all the rest of us, you know, I already have 35 hours of Zoom meetings a week. Um, but my only question is, what would we decide? I mean, if there's, in, we have three metrics and one is a two week metric, one sort of an immediate metric. If there's in school transmission, you would call an emergency meeting. So I, you know, and if we're going to do it, I would love it that we just did it. Like Humera said, we just sort of check in, but it's, it doesn't seem like there's necessarily any set decisions, right? Uh, because, you know, these data on a weekly basis are only helpful if the, we hit that one metric of in-school transmission. I guess the other metric of the percent positivity going above 3%, but we would, I don't know, I guess I'm just, why are we meeting? What's the, what decision would we make? Or is it simply informative? Yeah, Paul, I could see where data comes out Thursday night. It's no change from the prior week. It's not you know, to Tara's point, she's, she's looking at that percent positivity rate. And if we aren't seeing a major spike in something, I could see a, hey, no change from last week. Um, you know, I don't know why we would meet. If we met, it would be, it's no different than last week. But I could see where this, you know, I hope it's like that. I hope we're seeing downward trends or equal trends, but it's not trending that way now. So this may be more of kind of a safety net for us to just have it and plan for it and a quick touch base. So you're saying every Friday afternoon then? No. Oh, I, I'm sure there's a optimal. If you just said to follow the Thursday data, if you, then that really leaves no choice. I, I think if data comes out on Thursday, maybe. that Monday is still pretty soon after the, the, that, that time frame. I mean, look, we went triple and that was in two weeks, right? So we probably could have had a touch point in between that might have, um, might not have had the weight of this, these last two days decisions. Um, 
I think it could have it, it would have benefited us if we had a touch point in between. I think Monday would be um, reasonable if that's a little bit easier because anything that's going to be more of an emergency basis, if there's transmission in the school that Annie's concerned about, that's going to be an emergency meeting that we're not going to wait for. She's going to contact us. We're going to meet right away. So this is just really, again, my thought behind it is just because of the trajectory that we're having to make sure that what we have in place is still appropriate and that we don't need to think about slowing something down, stopping something sooner. And I, I, I would personally anticipate and appreciate, because again, it's not necessarily favorable for me either, um, to have it be a real quick check-in on a regular basis that in hopes that if we are looking at it regularly too, that it really can be quick. Unless there's something glaringly obvious going on that we'd need to discuss more. I, I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll chime in real quick. I I'm I, I guess I'm kind of a little bit with Paul on this. I I obviously I have no problem checking in, but I just don't know if the data looks good. It looks good. If it doesn't look good, I think it's safe to say that we probably call an emergency meeting. I mean, does that make sense? I I, I don't I don't know, and I don't know what we can change in that time if we were to meet every week. What I know, Terry, you mentioned that if we had to change something. What would we potentially change? I think it's more about because of our rate increase, we're able to just plan to meet quickly to check in on the data and not have to scurry around for an emergency meeting that's something that could have been just a quick check-in and a plan. Whereas something like a school transmission that's concerning to the school nurses or administration or whomever, that to me is considered something that we need to scurry around for and figure out how to get together fast. Whereas this is just a quick checkpoint like, okay, our numbers are now gone up by another X percentage. Do we still feel comfortable where we are? Do we need to talk a little bit more? No, I think we still feel comfortable okay, I meet in a week. That, that, that's my thought behind it. Tara, let me ask you about that. So I'm cool with booking the Monday meetings and having a set time, but I kind of feel like if the data comes out Thursday and it's still within our thresholds, like it is now, that I, I probably wouldn't need to meet on Monday and rehash that. I'd kind of feel like, okay, we're good. Um, obviously, if we have two metrics, if we have all metrics into the beyond our thresholds, we would be saying that Thursday night or Friday, we need to touch base Monday and decide what we're doing, unless that's what warrants an emergency. No, I think that's completely reasonable where we look at things and things haven't changed. But if we've threefold increased in a week and looking at numbers, then we might want to talk on Monday. You know what I mean? But if it's something where we're still that slow creep up and we're not concerned and the town's data is you know, not at a concerning point and it's at, you know, a half a case per day over two weeks. We're not as worried about that. There's no school transmission that we're worried about. I mean, I would assume we could cancel and not meet. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. So if we have a placeholder on our calendar for Mondays, a time that we all protect and we only use it in the event that we absolutely have to. And Annie, you could even submit those, um, you know, uh, plans to town hall that say we're having a meeting and just cancel when we're not using it. So we deploy it when we need to and we don't when we don't need to. I like that because that's in line with our really establishing these metrics and, and utilizing those as we move forward. And if we're going to do a placeholder for Mondays, so you already have 12-7 and 12-21 established. That means you would be adding 1130 and 1214, if that's what you would like. If you could just give me a sense of the time and I can make sure that those get posted. And to your point, you can always cancel the meeting. You can always start a meeting later. You cannot start it earlier. You cannot have meetings that you haven't posted. And you can always expect, you can, we can go in expecting that we're not gonna have that meeting unless you yeah. say we really are going to do this. We, we need it, we're gonna, you, you know, your protected time, it's on. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're already uh, prepared. And, mm -hmm. you know, with Town Hall, we, we're, um, mm -hmm. we're kosher. Yep. 
And I wouldn't be able to do before 5.30 feasibly. I would, I would not be home yet. Um, so I would ask that it be 5.30. And again, the intention was that it would be a quick meeting. It wouldn't be something where we're on an hour later. Agreed. Works for me. Me too. So the 30th of November and December 14th at 5.30 as a pencil it in placeholder meeting but you protected the time. Um, if we don't need it, we won't meet. I sure hope we don't need it. I hope the data looks great, but one can hope. Okay. So let's see, is there anything else then on this? I mean, we've reviewed the data, we've talked about uh, in combination with the phase Three uh, start in January 19, no earlier than that, January 19th of 21. Anything else we need to talk about on this topic? I know we need an action item to approve the minutes, but otherwise, is there any other information we need to cover here? No, sorry, just approval of the minutes. I was okay. emailing to you and asking for to post the meetings at Town Hall before I forgot. So Annie, on the with the the teachers working through what that looks mm -hmm. like uh, for Hopkins in particular, will they also talk about what like the evolution of that? How yeah, that I think that's what they're looking at. If you're going to build, I believe um, I looked at one proposal today, and uh, it's it's really complicated. <laughs> but yes, because you have to think all the way through, right? You don't sure. just stop at that one. You have to ask yourself what's going to happen. Okay which I didn't really ask myself that question in my great Monday idea of July. Um, so they I, are thinking I would that. ask that, that the evolution not just be six week cycles because yeah. you start January 19th, you only have two six week cycles. Mm -hmm. more school time. Yeah. So. And I would just ask that um, an email go out letting um, the community know of our changes and the phase and the half days. And and I just uh, also the point that you made, uh, I think Heather, that that if families wanted to opt in at any point that in in the in the near future that they're able to do that. There was a point made yesterday that I can't really articulate because my um, kiddos are going to stay remote, but um, other parents who's um, who want in person learning and whose kiddos aren't in person, uh, but rather are opting for remote because. Um, of the cohort model at Hopkins, um, there was an expression of, well, if only we realized that sending them back to school was actually in preparation for better in-person in um, data. Um, I, I can't really articulate that position well. I would invite any school committee member to do so if they wanted to urge uh, their peers to um, send their kids to school. I think that was really on the Hopkins level and the concern, at least on my end, and I didn't bring up the point, but what I think about when I think about it is that um, Hopkins has such a small population in the school right now. And if we talk about transitioning phases um, to have more in-person instruction, really ensuring that we're not changing more than one variable at a time. And so the concern behind that would be if we have a very large influx of students at the same time that we're um, changing how we're providing instruction to students vis-a-vis um, -vis mixing cohorts, um, the concern is are we still being as safe and cautious as we could be. And so I think that when that point was brought up, I I think when it was brought up, it was, I, I don't think any of us had thought of it that way, that, oh, maybe we should have communicated sooner. I mean, um, I just think that my concern behind it was that um, we really wanna be careful not to introduce too many variables at once and increase our risk to get us to the point where we'd have to consider moving back a phase or closing down the school. So Humer, the way I, I think what I, I think you were speaking to is the, the point and picking up on what Tara said, but I think the I know my child is not going back 
in Hopkins because he tried, uh, but it's not optimal to be sitting there remotely when other people are on different classes talking. He'd rather be home uh, where it's quieter, where he can do his work and remotely. So, but the point being is the intent might have been if he goes, it shows that this can work and it builds up momentum so that we can move into the next phase. So maybe more parents would be willing to sort of go through this trial period to sh figure out some of these logistics so that we can move into a phase where they can actually do more synchronous learning. Um, but I don't think that message was conveyed well. And maybe it's not true, right? You know, that the sort of there's a subjectivity to that argument that may not be true. Um, but I do think the reason that Hopkins, my experience from talking to parents, the reason that Hopkins has such a low in-person participation rate, you know, a, qu a quarter versus 80% in elementary is because they are essentially doing what they're doing in their basement. They're sitting alone mm -hmm. on a computer. Um, yes, they can have assistance there and that is beneficial for some, it was beneficial for my son to have some structure. He returned home because it was too loud. The teacher mm -hmm. who was teaching in the room was teaching a different class and he had to listen to that while he was trying to learn from the different class. And that's just the logistics of mm -hmm no accusation it's just the logistics so if there's some way that i know this is what the teachers are trying to figure out if there's some way they can ameliorate that situation a little bit and create some more synchronous learning in that half day that they're there i think you will see more kids and then we sell it as look this will be the first step maybe we can get to the next evolution maybe it won't take six weeks and that second evolution looks like this so start here now it's, again it's not optimal but it's, it's the building block to the next better phase and I think what you folks there's have no, said, I'm sure Hopkins could, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, because if there's no change, then it could mean right. that not only are we moving to a phase and switching up classrooms, but also we're going from 20 to 80% overnight. And that is a lot of variables to introduce overnight and, and subject to putting people in unsafe situations. Maybe and I think that- come up with. I mean, uh, Hadley Elementary went to 80% and I know they're cohorting um, and they've been doing great. So maybe there's lessons we can learn from that. They were probably close to, Hadley Elementary is probably close to 50% because about 50% of the entire district population qualified as special populations. Right. Um, just shy, So they already were, were at a much higher rate. But I would say, I think I'll, I'll make sure I ask Hopkins to think through that I do respect and understand where the parents are coming from and the students are coming from. Again, I'm the first to admit it's far from optimal, you know, far from optimal and we're still working on it, but maybe they can communicate, look in preparation for this, even if you just come a couple of weeks in advance of this, because there's also a lot of routines. Granted, the children are older, but it's a lot. It looks very different, right? Particularly if you've been at home learning on your, um, you know, getting up, going to the fridge, doing what high schoolers do all day long. And now there's arrows on the side of the hallway. This is second nature to the elementary faculty and the elementary students, but it looks very different. And when I do, even for the small amount of students who are currently at Hopkins, when I do bus duty in the morning, when I'm there, uh, the days that I'm there with the principal, I, um, you know, kids every day have questions. Where do I go? It's very different. So um, I'll ask them to communicate what makes sense to try to encourage. And I think if the, the plan that the Hopkins faculty presents, um, if they can appeal to uh, the support from the community, I know the community will step up. They have all year long if they just understand what would be helpful. And I hate to say the word survey, but I wonder if <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. thing. Um, you know, just getting an idea. So as April and the staff are really trying to figure this out, um, you know, again, it's about that percent increase. If the numbers aren't going to change that much in Hopkins, even if we're adjusting a phase, then I, you know, it's not as important. But if, if a lot of situations are similar to Paul's situation, um, and numbers do go up drastically, it'd just be good to know ahead of time because it might shape um, how they um, construct the phase. I don't think yeah, I, over survey in this situation. Ethan. No, and I, and I think, and I, you know, I, this is something that I certainly talked a little bit about yesterday. And I think, I, I guess the way I looked at it and the reason I brought it up was I just, I, I think it's the, the, the multiple variables kind of coming together at once and the idea of having more kids in school, even if it isn't 
you know, the most ideal situation or the perfect situation gives us a sense of how the school can function um, with, with that number of students at it. And I know it's not, and it's to each family's decision and, and, and I respect that. I just, um, I, I think maybe the survey does help us get a better understanding of how many families would come back given what the next phase would look like. Um, because I think in my mind that the quickest way to move to the next phase and to the next phase and to the next phase, Paul, to your point of wanting to be able to move is, is to have the kids in there and run that phase successfully. And we, right now, I guess we can't do that at Hopkins because we don't have the population. And that's always just been something in the back of my mind is it, at what point will we have the population? Will it be only when um, we're, we're full synchronous or will it be, will we start to see kids come back as we introduce these new phases? I think I'm hearing two different, slightly nuanced things. One is a survey to see who might come back and willing to run the current scenario even before we know what the next phase is because we're not going to sure what that, we're not really sure what that next phase is. And it's not, well, we're not going to know until December something, right? So, uh, I think we've got time to, I mean, the nice thing is that we don't have, I mean, we've got a, a I mean, we've got time. We've got until January 19th. Um, and I don't necessarily think we need to do a survey right away. I think we can maybe help figure out what that next phase is going to be and then put that out to the families to see if they would return. But we know enough now that we, we know that the intention was that phase three was going to be one day, um, full day in person learning. And now we're modifying that and that the goal is really to start to introduce in person instruction, right? If it's safe, like we, we discussed that last night between both groups that mm -hmm. the goal is to start to move that way. So I think if families have an idea that that's the goal to start to move that way. And then to Ethan's point, just figuring and to Paul's point, just getting kids back in the building with the anticipation of we want to move this direction but we need to move cautiously who's willing to you know whose intention would be to come back to school for phase three because I don't know if you can really predict before that but coming back for phase three knowing that the intention would be to start to introduce some um, in-person learning just to give the teachers an idea of what it might look like as they're transitioning from all these kids coming back to then starting to introduce however that may look the in-person learning. And I guess that's my point is that we could probably get started with the surveying sooner than knowing exactly what it is because we know that it will be in, involved. Some right. I think it would be we, Can we and please strike this down if it can't happen is there a way for us to ask those families that have, have decided to be remote, the, the reasoning behind it, just to have a better sense of, um, you know, if we know that there's a certain population that isn't going to come back because of health risks, which is completely understandable, um, you know, being able to understand what the overall end numbers may look like, right? Like if we know we're only going to get to 60% capacity and we're at 25% now, um, how, do we, how do we navigate that? I don't, again, strike it out if it's obnoxious. I think you could say something along the lines of personal versus the way the school is operating. Right. I, yeah, I'm not looking for specific reasons. I just like to kind of get a better sense of if they're thinking about coming back into the building at all this year. I don't know if it's pertinent, though. That would be my only question is that if it's really pertinent or not. I don't know if it would if it would help us. Like if we know that we're going to start transitioning in phases and we get an idea of who's staying remote versus who's coming in, I still think you're gonna get a good amount of people influxing into the school, I do, um, knowing that the phase is gonna change and kids are gonna start to move in that direction. I don't know if you'd get any value out of it, but I personally don't think it should be anything more than will you stay remote for, or were you remote for personal reasons or was your child remote due to the schedule set up or something do you know what i mean i and just don't know knowing, and knowing that the schedule is going to change will do you intend to send your kid back right is what we need to hear and i think right. sooner rather than later is probably better so that we can plan accordingly so that the what what is designed is with that percentage in mind i agree yeah so oh go ahead heather go ahead i, I was just going to say ethan it sounds like you're trying to isolate like 
what percentage of the population isn't going to come back to in-person regardless because of personal reasons. So that may be there needs to be a vaccine until we're coming back in. That's to me that, I mean, that's yeah, I, I think I'm just trying to help, help the, the Hopkins team navigate what the next phases are going to look like. Um, if they have a better sense of what the, the numbers may look like. But again, I don't know if that's something we need to do. I think more information is better than less information. And a well-designed survey will prevent us from having to administer three surveys in the next two months. So it would be great if we were very intentional about the kinds of questions we were asking, um, not hesitating to send out surveys at all, but, but get as much information as we possibly can. And be clear on the intent of the survey, because that's something that has come up in the past that our intentions on what we're trying to collect out of that survey really needs to be very clear. Yeah, good point. I, I agree we need to be have our intentions clear. I, I do worry about survey fatigue. I, I feel that we did, I actually heard backlash from our last surveys that we did get public feedback, that we didn't listen to it. So we want to make sure we, we couch it properly. I don't know if it's meaningful, any to the administration to know 50% are coming back versus 55 versus 60. I don't know what is actionable information for you. And I do know as a parent, if you tell me you're going to send your kids back during your 19th, I'm going to ask, well, what is it going to look like? And if you can't tell me that, then I'm going to say, I can't tell you. So I'm inclined so, to, but I need more yeah. details. And so, what I, if I'm understanding correctly? If I'm not, school committee correct me. But what I'm hearing is this: the school committee is um, has a desire to be helpful, and you are being very helpful. I think what makes the most sense is I, to your point, Paul. I asked the administration and the teachers who are all the teachers are involved, but there's a task force in the planning. What information do you need to know in order to plan effectively, and that that would then drive. The information that we ask people for. That's good. That seems fair. Okay. Um, I do need a motion on the minutes from last night to approve those minutes or if there are any revisions. So, so moved. Is there a second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so we approve the minutes. We have a direction for a survey um, and gathering information from the administration as to what would be helpful for them to know for planning purposes. We have additional meetings on the books. We have uh, a phase three that is going to be presented to us in a future meeting uh, for Hopkins. And um, it sounds like our next meeting is still going to be, uh, well, it's going to be November 30th is what we tentatively have penciled in for uh, really specifically a review of the data as needed. Did I get everything? All right. Anything else for tonight? No. You're is good there, to adjourn. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? You're kidding, right? Okay. <laughs> Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank